Hello, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this special uh, Hasselbad webinar in association with Wex Photo Video. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Mark Whitney, uh, part of Hasselbad's uh, marketing team. And um, today we've got a, as I say, a special webinar with Gillian uh, uh, Edelstein. I'm going to be talking about some of her work and uh, particularly with some projects that she shot in Johannesburg. Uh, so just before we meet Gillian, uh, just to explain that this series of webinars by WEX is on a particular theme of change the image. And there's a series of uh, webinars on the subject of supporting diversity and equality in the industry. So uh, Hasselbad are very proud to be part of this and uh, helping to, uh, to bring this uh, content to you today um, in, in, with the help of Gillian. So just a quick agenda, um, an introduction to Gillian in a second, and then we're gonna look at her Truth and Lies um, project, uh, the Affinities project, and then if we get some time, some of her general portraits as well. Uh, the approximate running time of this, we estimate to be about 50 minutes, uh, which will hopefully give us some time for some Q&A. So on the YouTube live feed, you're able to, um, to answer, uh, ask some questions there. And uh, I'll try and have a look every now and again and try and squeeze them into the conversation with Gillian. So hi, Gillian, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. Yeah, no, thanks for joining us. Um, it's, a, it's, it's great to have you with us. Um, such a great photographer. Um, we've got a little bit there on your bio. Um, so yeah, did you want to explain a little bit, just summarise yourself as a photographer and, you know, how you got started and, uh, you know, what your interest is in photography? That's a huge question, <laughs> Mark. But um, yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I would consider myself as if I'm branching out even now, but mainly a portrait, a documentary and a film documentary is a new thing for me. I've been working on two at the moment. But the portrait and the social documentary began, I think, a long time ago when I was still living in South Africa and being formed by a very um, indiscriminate, um, ghastly system of apartheid, which discriminated against people because of the color of their skin. And I think it's formed the basis of my work always. Okay, yeah, so obviously that uh, rings, uh, you know, associates very well with today's topic of the, mm. the WEX uh, webinars. Um, so it says here that you, you obviously graduated as a social worker before yeah. then becoming a, a, a press photographer. So how did that change happen? What was the... the, the so, the yes, about? how it happened is that I was working from a very young age. I remember my mother was the chief medical social worker that, uh, where they did the first heart transplant at Kuritiskia Hospital. And I used to go into townships with her uh, namely one was district six which was being demolished and so my memories are of this vibrant community that was being shoved out for reasons of of, of as i've said kind of brutal hideosity um, by the south african um, oppressive regime and so i then took on that same mantle even though she had tried to persuade me to take up my um, love of languages or film work. And I followed into the social worker realms of, and but found myself in, back in the townships. And those subjects that I had, and I was working at something that dealt with cr the uh, crime and rehabilitation of offenders, I found myself um, going back to the people that I had to interview for my case studies and photographing them. And then the photography, which I'd begun on the university campus really just took over. And that's really how it began. And I started working on my first personal project, which was in a, which was in a fishing community in Cape Town. They had to allow the fishermen to stay because they needed the fish to be fished out of the, the Cape waters. Everybody's probably seen my octopus teacher. That was the area. And um, they, they didn't have the infrastructure then to ship these workers in from the townships. So it was the only multiracial community that existed in probably most of South Africa. And I lived in it. And that was my first personal project. I tried to get the work um, exhibited. That may have led me into a, a, a sort of art and um, sort of tangent. 
but somehow it didn't. And I became an assistant to a fashion photographer, commercial photographer, and then shifted into the world of press, which was quite hardcore in the 80s, as most people know from, you know, the kind of bang bang club and that kind of thing. There was a, mm. there was a lot of um, very intense political movement to try and overthrow apartheid happening at that time. Okay, well, let's uh, uh, move on and look at some of your images. Um, so just to let everyone know, we've got your web address there and your Instagram uh, profile. Uh, so a lot of the images we're going to be showing today are sort of some of your older images. Um, but your latest work is on your website and uh, Instagram, so people can go and find more there. So, and then also with uh, association with Hasselblad, we'll just get the uh, the camera bits and pieces out of the way. Um, so you've used a 500 series Hasselblad for most or some of your career. So how did you, how did that come about? So when I worked as a assistant photographer, the the sort of more commercial photographers were working with high end lighting. Um, we were processing and printing in the darkroom, and most of them were working on medium format cameras. And so I, that was the learning curve. And when I went into the portrait work, because in mid 85, I thought that I should come and study. And I joined what was, you know, the LCC, London College of Communications. It was then LCP. And, um, and I was sort of picked up by the Sunday Times because I had printed a portfolio before I left and the picture editor then asked me to come and do some work. And it was soon after I left the Sunday Times that I started playing again with lighting and medium format cameras. And that's when I um, developed my love, which had already begun in the studios of, of, you know, of these commercial photographers, my real love of the Hasselblad and also probably because, you know, I was around with the first moonwalk and I knew that Hasselblad had been on the moon and that was quite cool for me. And I think it was the sturdiness and the kind of hardiness. Um, and so some of my favorite images of all the projects that I've worked on have been taken using a Hasselblad camera really. I did then move on to large format four by five with a tripod. Um, for my Truth and Lies series, which was about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and um, that work. So, but the Hasselblad has always been at my side and continues to be so. Okay, that's good to hear. Um, yeah, and uh, you mentioned there you use large format as well. So a little disclaimer that not every image in this presentation is shot on your Hasselblad and we've, we've uh, selected a variation. Um, yeah, just so that everyone can, can note that. And you say about continuing to use Hasselblad, uh, so recently, you've also had a play with the new uh, 907X or the, the CFV2 digital back on your V-System camera. So how did you find that? Oh, well, I found it and um, the, the results are alarmingly good, <laughs> if I can use that way of describing them. Um, the colours kind of, um, like your presentation today, Mark, they kind of ring out and sing. <laughs> They're very beautiful and it's a very interesting um, take when you kind of have to um, engender the square format on a digital camera. And but I but I but I love it. And 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 uh, and the results are are all in the yeah, they're all in the results really. <laughs> okay. And then, uh, then just again, very quickly, uh, just to some latest news. So Hasselblad of today announced a special version, an anniversary version of that camera. Um, so as I say, only just announced in the last hour or so. Um, so special uh, edition with a different uh, finish and styling to it uh, to celebrate Hasselblad's 80th anniversary. So you can check that out on uh, Wex's website. It's very beautiful, the camera, <laughs> I think, yeah. as well. Yes. Um, OK, so let's get on to the pictures. So Truth and Lies. So tell us a little bit more about this project. So I think any project that I've worked on um, has always been something of a passion and has then transformed into a full blown commitment, not only with the image making, but the research and the writing. And um, this began 
um, when after Mandela had been released from Robben Island and my, I was living here in the UK, I'd, I'd, I'd never went back to live in South Africa after 85. And, um, but I visited my parents who were still living there and I saw these events unfolding on, and, and, and they were the hearings that the, the idea of the Truth Commission had come about, Mandela and Desmond Tutu had inaugurated it I, I remember writing to Desmond Tutu, begging him for me to be the official photographer of, of the process. Um, and the hearings were like kangaroo courts all over the country. So it was very difficult because I was living here. I had to um, work and do my portrait work to, to fund the project. So I was going backwards and forwards. And um, for example, these two images, um, the first one ended up being the cover of the book. And these are the two young men who were the youngest men to testify during um, the, the process began in 96 and ended in 2000, more or less 2000, 2001. And they were two young men who were protesting in a very kind of um, rural area and the police had shot them um, with kind of, um, I think they were more sort of pellets, but they they remembered that situation. I always remember the one said um, when they were asked what they wanted to do when they grew up, the one said he wanted to become a prison warden and the other one said a social worker, which was quite interesting in my mind. The other image on the, um, in, on the left of the flag is taken from the ferry going towards Robben Island. I believe it was um, at the millennium, at the, you know, at, in 2000, when I had booked a trip to go and look at Mandela's cell and the, and the confines of Robben Island. Um, and I always imagined what it would be like for those prisoners when they were making that journey, knowing that they were going to, for example, Mandela, who was then 26 years in captivity, as we all know from the from the songs and the yeah. yes um yeah so um a couple more images here and i think um interesting story for the image on the right there that i've heard you tell me before tell. this was reverend um lapsley and he was the african national congress chaplain um and he was living in lesotho and um he was obviously considered a threat by the security police and he was sent a letter bomb, which exploded in his hands and it disfigured his face. I don't know about his body. And he had those prosthetics and he agreed to, if I couldn't get to the hearings in time, I very often would get in touch with the people, the victims, the perpetrators afterwards and request a session with them. And um, so I was having to follow the hearings quite closely he agreed to it. I photographed that image and then Time magazine ran the image, but we had cropped the image so that you could just see the prosthetic and the cross. And he rang me up in a very angry mood afterwards and said, please don't ever use that image again because don't, I do not want you to reduce my disability to a disability. And in keeping with his wish, I never ever did. I had thought that maybe I would you know, I, I'm sure that I did shoot it that way, but he, he had every right to make that request from me. The man on the left was the head of the um, covert undercover South African security operation. His name was Dirk Kutsir. He was the first person to come forward and apply for amnesty during the Truth Commission, because that was the extraordinary thing about the process is that the perpetrators could come forward and if they applied for amnesty, they would probably not have to, they, they would go ahead without impunity. They wouldn't have to be imprisoned. And um, Dirk Kutsi agreed to be photographed. I set up always these backgrounds and studios and we were in his home at this time. I think I was with, I'm um, usually alone, but I was with a, a New York Times magazine journalist and Kutsir was wandering around his house with this little wallet strapped to his wrist and he was serving us these tea in these dainty china cups and I said to him what is that that you're carrying around your arm I'm, I'm intrigued and he said no it's my gun I take it wherever I go even if I go to the 
toilet, he said. And I was staggered. Um, and he was living behind barbed wire with high fencing. And I took him outside and I said, can I photograph you? And with this gun, the Alsatians were barking in the background. And, um, and we took that photograph and in a way for me, it, it signified his, his, his real fear. This bully who had so much fear. Yeah. So um, the, the image on the right is Desmond Tutu and I photographed him a f many times when I was there. And this image I requested because I'd photographed him and I wasn't happy enough with the image. And the night before I went to do that photograph, I was with a bunch of colleagues and I said, let's talk about what you think the penultimate, the main um, image of this, that, that shows what this truth commission has all been all about. And they said, well, they felt that when Desmond Tutu had wept because he was listening to a story, an un, a very searing story about a Robben Island prisoner who had been tortured and he wept. And um, when I went to photograph him, I told him this story about our discussion. And I said, I know this seems strange, but I'd kind of like to recreate that image. And he said, I'm, I would do it with pleasure. And anyway, I'm so tired. And he put his hands in his, in his head in his hands as if he was about, about weeping. And, um, that is that image, and it so couldn't really be anybody else, I think, but Desmond Tutu. No. And the woman on the right, on the left, um, no. oh no, that she was holding the hair of her son. He had been tortured, detained, released, tortured, detained, and then fed rat poison. And she was holding the hair of her son. And in a way, she was Charity Condelia. She was very, very angry, I think. Um, no, I'm sorry, her name was Joyce Ntunkulu. And, um, but it also shows a defiance, I think, in mm. that holding the fist up. Yeah. Yeah, very powerful images. And we've actually got a, a question come in from oh, yes. Ayo. Um, he's thanking you for your insightful backstories. And he's also asking, what does photography mean to you? You know, how important is it for you to be able to tell these stories through your images? I... I seriously couldn't imagine my life without having been able to tell these stories. I consider it a, a blessing, a privilege, and um, I'm, I'm completely driven to do it. I can't help myself. It just is very, a very powerful part of my life, really, mm. is the truth. Yeah. Um, this image, the man on the right holding the cigarette, his name was Gideon Nivot. He's a man who's accused of, of killing Steve Biko. He had the audacity, as he's standing there, to ask me out that night, which obviously I declined very immediately. The man on his, with the gun in his um, holster is, is his witness protector, a man called Mike Bernardo. And um, it was very hard because I think he was fairly shameless and didn't have very much, um, you know, uh, there was he was not feeling very remorseful is what it looked like to me the woman on the left holding the jugs and the tissues they were called comforters and they were the woman who stood behind um the men the woman the the victims telling these pretty um terrifying stories and so they would rub the back of the of the of the person given their testimony or they would offer them water sometimes you know while people were weeping or choking with with uh, these tough stories okay and then probably you know one of your most iconic images is this very powerful portrait of nelson mandela uh, so what was it like to to meet him so it's um um I'm going to name drop here because <laughs> the only person who, who feels like he had the similar reaction to me was, was Bob Geldof. And I met him after some charity do. And I, I remember saying, um, I felt like when I was in his presence, it felt like that, that 
that feeling of when you smile that the face that the smile is going to crack your your face your face in two it felt almost like meeting and and I and also I sound so kind of twee and weird when I tell the story but it did feel like I was in the presence of something much bigger than it, anything I can even describe. As you can hear, I'm going all completely inarticulate on myself. But I was given 10 minutes to photograph him. I was told at that time that his eyes were damaged from the limestone quarry, the bright lights, because it's very, you know, Southern African searing bright light. And um, these guys, these men, these political prisoners were bound to do the hard labor, knocking up the, in, the, in the limestone quarries. Later, um, I know that I did see images where people had used flash, so maybe something happened that I don't know about later. But at that time, they were said, you've got 10 minutes, no flash. And um, I remember putting my light meter in front of his shirt, famous Mandela shirts, remember he always wore these incredible embroidered and patterned shirts and he'd get up and dance with them it, it was fabulous I mean I put my light meter and he he went to grab it and I said that's okay President Mandela or Madiba I can't remember what I called him and um he said what do I know I'm just a I'm just a I'm just a country bumpkin I'll never forget that. <laughs> and I think this image is powerful because at that time, a lot of the images of Mandela were of him smiling and laughing and joking. And there was just this moment, we, we was sat on the veranda of the presidential Tone House Garden, it's called. And there was just this moment where he just looked reflective and sad. Yeah, no, very And I think, I think it was when, the, the breakup with Winnie Mandela had happened already. Mm. So. Okay, let's, uh, let's move on. So five perpetrators here. <laughs> so that was a scary image to take because um, those men um, were coming out of a hearing. They were accused of killing um, a policeman, happened to be a black policeman and his wife. Why I'm saying that? Because everything always is in racial terms in South Africa. So I have to stress that because later, what, what I discovered is that the police man and the police woman's son was a toddler and they left this toddler on the floor of the, they were in a rondavel, which is a thatched house, very kind of um, in, in, a, in a township. And I know that the grandmother lived nearby and she was so scared that she wouldn't go over during the night. So this poor young man, young toddler, and I remember meeting him when he was much older, he was about 14, with the grandmother in, so in Soweto. And I imagine that um, even, you know, as they say, the critical years from zero to five, Bowlby, the psychologist, said those were critical years and I'm sure that it formed and, and formed has formed and damaged his, his life. But the interesting thing about those five perpetrators who looked, who operated in a band of thugs, the man on the, um, on the crutches, I saw some days later when I was flying back to London and he was alone and I could see his absolute vulnerability you know, that fact that he wasn't emboldened by this crew of, of, of brigands. Mm. Yeah. Now I've got a couple more questions come in um, yes. from Gary and Nick Can. Um, they're um, referencing your use of black and white for these images. Yeah. Um, and so Nick is saying, was the choice of black and white photos a reference to the bleakness of the time or an extension of how you as the photographer felt the world they lived through the through your own photographer's eye. Um, I think he's answered, Nick, if I have the right name, I think he's answered the question. Mm. I, I, I couldn't, I did try and do, sometimes I would shoot color transparencies. I think the image on the right, funny the question came in now of, of these were the widows of the Craddock Four. They were four men who were, who were killed 
when they were on their way to pick another activist up at the airport and they were never seen again. And they were brutally murdered, the, the, these two women on, on, on the right. And I do remember photographing that image in black, in color, sorry. And um, something about the power of the black and white and maybe exactly that, the fact that it was such a bleak time, I felt, it, it, it felt that that was the right choice to go with the black and white. The image of the woman in the woods with her handbag on the ground, she's standing in the woods where her son was murdered during the, um, this was in KwaZulu Natal and there is a, um, South African security police stoked violence. They stoked the violence between the African National Congress and the Nkata Zulu um, other side rebels and the two, there was a mighty kind of um, endless, endless conflict that probably exists still today, really. Hmm. Okay, and talking about today, um, just going back to another question from Nick. Um, he's saying uh, stunning images, but it appears that nothing has changed much for black people in South Africa. Um, do you feel that these images have helped change the way that South Africa is now? Okay, so I have to be very clear that I don't live there now. I'm, I'm mm. lesser in touch with the situation. I do see huge holes in the system. And, and I mean, this morning I was reading about ghastly corruption in the arts, where because of the pandemic, money had not been allocated to the artists who were struggling to get their fair share of the, you know, propping, propping theatre and artists and novelists and people up. So the, the situation is, I think, for me, fairly tragic. It did escape some kind of bloodbath that people had feared, but there is still ample work to be done and that's clear and i think when 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 there has been a brutalization which the the, the people with black people as you can say it who were brutalized by a ghastly system there's bound to be toxicity and ramifications that take years to to fix really yeah. that's the sad truth of it and i hope that answered the question um, this was in um, at the back uh, on the hearing of the Winnie Mandela, and this was the members, some of the members of the um, police, but also the Winnie Mandela Football Club, and these men were accused of killing a 14-year-old activist called Stompy Moketsi, and um, this is the only time that I managed to get an image of a victim and perpetrator in one frame. And that was the man with the football and the mother of Stompy, the 14 year old activist. And it happened by chance because I was in a side room and they came in at the same time. And it was probably the most awkward image besides the five perpetrators that I took through this uh, process of the Truth Commission. Yes. Um, what sort of reactions and, and sort of willingness did you get from these people to, to photograph them? Um, were they very willing to, you know? Well, I yeah, I mean, the, the, what surprised me was that often the perpetrators would, would come forward with great amount of ease and vanity almost. And I think when it's that thing that most people would like their story told, whether told whether they've, you know, created some some awful narratives so it did surprise me but most people would would there you i mean there you have it um on the left are four um uh, four portraits of uh, perpetrators the man ironically with the big suitcase was a bomb maker he came to the hearing with his big his suitcase which looked like he may have hidden some other things there Craig Williamson with the teacup was um, the man who sent a letter bomb um, to probably Ruth First, who was the wife of Joe Slovo, the head of Omkontwe um, Wisizwe. And um, he infiltrated the um, university students on campus as an informer to the um, so all those chaps. And the, the woman on the right is also one of the comforters. The, um, 
people. Her name was Fikile Mutkwa, and she is holding her hands, I think, in her face as probably as a memory of just everything that she'd seen um, while she had to produce the tissues and the jug of water and the Kleenex and help people deal with what they were telling the stories. Okay, and another question from Gary. Um, he's saying um, that the a lot of your images, uh, you know, are taken straight on, uh, looking into the eyes of your subjects. Uh, do you find it's more powerful that way? Um, I, th I think they they they, at the, it suited this project very. I'm not like that anymore. I'm kind of much more varied. I'd say this was a stage, you know, that went on through the '90s. I'd say '90s through to the beginning of 2003 or something when I finished this project. Um, but it seemed applicable and appropriate for this, for this work. Mm. Okay. I wanted people probably to look into the lens of the camera, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, that brings us to the end of that project. Um, but feel free, uh, still feel free to ask any questions uh, through the YouTube live stream chat. And we can always come back to it later. Uh, but we're going to have a little move on now to look at your affinities uh, images. And so we've got this one here of Darcy Bustle and Jonathan Cope. And talk us a bit through this one, if you could, please. So this process, this project was created um, in um, the early 90s when I, 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 w I had gone through my own emotional trauma. I'd broken up with somebody and I lost this sort of my surrogate family and I then started working very hard and the people that I met because of the work that I was um you know my work commissions were became my friends and they were like the actress Jane Horrocks and a novelist uh, Patrick Gale they're all still friendly with today um Tom Miller and what happened is that I looked at this process of meeting people because of the work that we create and, and the idea of creative collaboration. And um, it, it's, it's an interesting project because I continued, I stopped for quite a long time and then I revisited, I began to revisit it, not, you know, in the last five or six years. And, and what, what it's proved to me is that it's the affirmation of friendship and working partnerships and and really, you know, a kind of testimony to, to, to life and what friendship and collaboration means in our world. And in fact, at the beginning of lockdown, I started looking at the projects again, and then I'd made a lot of films um, in the recent work, films of um, Leonard Cohen and um, uh, Van, not, uh, what's his name, um, the filmmaker Vim Vendors, I'd made of John le Carre before he died and Philippe Sands and I started and Jane Horrocks and I started building little films which I called Behind the Colorama and I they, they I think there are some of them are on my website one got pulled down I think is the one I did of um of um Richard E Grant and Bruce Robinson probably because of film rights or something right. but getting back to you to answer your question um I, I often kind of, um, I may, may have seen Darcy Bustle um, in that sort of position. And so I remember we did, we set up the studio at the back of the Royal Opera House and um, Jonathan Cope was her partner. And I asked her to get into this position. And it feels very much like it was telling the story of ballet dancers and how the, the women often need to be supported by powerful men and and this kind of says it all I think that you know he's just standing there and she can absolutely um rely on on his on his holding her really mm. okay and you mentioned uh Richard E Grant so this yes is, this, images... this needs like a bit of color correction so forgive me but um I I slipped it in because the, the one on the left is Richard E. Grant and Bruce Robinson, like in the 90s. And then we re I revisited them. And um, I remember, and we made this fabulous film, um, which um, where Richard E. Grant is joking with, um, with Bruce Robinson about how um, 
you know, you, the, the, you can see by the the way their skin is that Bruce Robinson has been a hard, probably a, <laughs> I don't think he drinks anymore, but maybe at times in his life, kind of taking many sort of lot of booze and Richard E. Grant is a known sort of teetotaler, I think. So mm. we had a very jokey, wonderful session together. And I'm longing for that to be exhibited in this film to be part of the installation, because it's a lot of fun. And it's very Wicknell and I, if, if any of the audience know that iconic film. Yeah. And then um, another um, couple of images, um, sort of a few years apart, so um, Ian McKellen and Sean Mathias, and um, again, I, 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 I made a message to Sean McKellen, and of course they are still great friends. They, they were partners at one point. They now own a pub in the East End, and they have a, a lot of fun together. And um, that was in Hackney, and the, the other one was in Brick Lane, and... Um, it just, I wanted it to evoke their wonderful, um, happy friendship and, and partnership. Yeah, and I think that comes across very nicely. Yes, yeah, so Bob Kingdom and Anthony Hopkins. Yes, yeah, so um, they were working on a play about a one-man show about Dylan Thomas. And, um, and this just happened, you know, kind of uh, just... It, it, it sort of organically this pose that they went into and um, th they clearly had a very good um, bond because of the, their, their shared heritage really. Mm. Okay. And then uh, Colin Jackson and Linford Christie, the, the athlete. Well, <laughs> this is taken in the VIP lounge in he at Heathrow. They were about oh, wow. to they were about to go for a training session to Australia. Linford Christie was late. Colin Jackson was there. And for some reason, I had, um, I had this idea that maybe they should be photographed with, with their shirts off. Maybe I was, you know, maybe I was at that time influenced by Annie Leibovitz, who seemed to be photographing everybody with their shirts off. But I remember Colin standing there and he didn't have a shirt on and, Linford Christie arriving like the athlete. I mean, literally he bounded over this chair. It was like they were, you know, as if they were about to kind of fly onto the aeroplane rather than, you know, walk. And we had this, um, I mean, the, the image, I can't say more than, because the image just tells about this kind of great um, friendship. And um, yeah, and then they were getting on the plane and going off. So, so how did you set up the shot to get sort of nice, like a nice white, pure white background? So I had set up a studio. So I would oh, arrive okay. at Heathrow with coloramas, oh, okay. backdrop, um, lighting. That's how I was functioning a lot at that time. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And then the Hervey sisters. So um, that was in a hotel in the Brunswick set, in like the Brunswick Square. And um, I don't think this was actually, I think I've snuck it into Affinities, but I think I was doing a series for the Dogs Trust and it was the renaming of the Dogs Trust. It's had a dreadful name before that. I think the, something like the Canine Defence League. And, um, and um, so that was why I had been commissioned to photograph them. Um, so it's not not truthfully a creative collaboration because they were the sisters but you know it was just that the the kind of the this sort of the dogs and what they were wearing in this funny hotel you know and the and also I love the fact that the wires I love mistakes so I love the wires and plugs that you can see down the, the corridor yeah yeah <laughs> like very real yeah yeah Okay, then uh, Anne Scott James and Bert Hardy. So this is in, in my studio, um, which at the time was in North London. And um, Bert Hardy was, um, well, they, they, Anne Scott James was um, a journalist and writer. And he was, as we know, one of the main um, photographers of the ancient picture post. And um, 
I did the photograph and I got him on his own and hurt the two of them together. And I, I remember thinking, I'm sure this could be better. I could do something much more. And she said, I've got to go and take a cab. I must order a cab. And she was about to do that. And she had her bag, you know, in her hand. And it was that moment of like him then just deciding he was going to do the last shot of her and me doing the same thing. And that's how that moment happened. Mm. Do, are you, a lot of your sub subjects for your photos uh, do you try and pose them naturally in a way or yeah I think you know I think Mark it's so much my history of being a press documentary that it, the, and then combining that kind of setup situation with the two that I think um so that there's a, something kind of organic and natural about it as well as stylized if I can, if, if that's the way I can describe them. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense, yep. Okay, and then we've got some of your general portraits as well, um, just to finish off with. And so we've got this one here. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, I'm glad that it makes you laugh and me laugh. So this is, um, actually, her name was Marika Rivera. She was the daughter of, and actually, if you look at her face, you can see the similarity. Diego Rivera, who lived with, um, uh, I've just gone blank, the famous uh, Frida Kahlo. Um, have I got that right? Yes, I have. Um, and if you look at her face, you can see the resemblance. And she lived alone. She was an artist. And she, her mother had been this a French artist as well. And she lived alone in, in Ealing with something like 13 dogs. I kid you not how I managed not to have one in the image, because I don't think there is. But she also was so game when I arrived, you know, she was wearing this corset with these big strand of pearls and this wild headdress. And she was, I mean, how, how could you go wrong with such an extraordinary subject? Um, she was the muse also for, um, if I have this right, for, um, I want to say beaten. And I think I'm right. Cecil Beaton. Or oh, no, I am wrong. I'm sorry. It was Angus McBain. Ah, okay. Yes, mm. forgive me. <laughs> okay, and this is a uh, Tommy Hill figure. That's Tommy Hill figure, and that was a commission for the Sunday Times magazine, and it was at London Fashion Week. And he had these incredible, you know, Kate Moss and Alec Weck and all these amazing models. And um, that image was just literally um, standing in the, on the platform of where the, the show was going to be. And he did this, you know, he put up his hand as if he was, you know, waving, high-fiving, doing something to somebody. And, and for me, that was the, the, that natural moment that happened. And it yeah. says quite a lot about him, I think. Yeah. Now looking through your images, uh, you've shot quite a few um, for the Sunday Times. So have they been quite a regular client for you? Yes. I mean, I wish I wish lately. <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. But um, I used to work a lot with a photo editor called um, Aidan Sullivan. And then lots of there have been a lot of people who worked there and have moved on to other magazines subsequently. But yes, that was incredibly, incredibly lucky. And I think the extraordinary thing about in Sullivan at the time, and I've said it before, is that he did, he was a, a, a wonderful risk taker. He, he commissioned, I remember a photographer like Harriet Logan when she was pregnant to go to Afghanistan. And if I have that right, I think I do. And he, photo, he commissioned me when I was just, you know, having given birth. And I think that, gave one the confidence, it, it was pretty scary, but it gave me the confidence to go straight back into work. And that was, I'm forever grateful to him for having done that really. Mm. Um, I remember, you know, he said, how would you like to go and photograph? I think it was um, John Malkovich, it was. And, and, and my, my now, you know, she, she was then, you know, 10 days old. And this kind of what what you have to do to kind of go oh my gosh you know I'd better I better get myself together and um, 
I remember that being an extraordinary shoot, actually. Um, this is Clive James looking into um, Cherry Hall's breasts. Um, that was, <laughs> it was a shoot for Marie Claire. And I remember the title was something my date with, with Clive James, or maybe it was my date with Jerry Hall, but I think it was Clive James supposedly interviewing um, Jerry Hall. And I remember writing this thing, he was saying, oh, if I'm, if I must impress her, I'll have to, I'll have to recite something from Balzac, you know, typical Clive James, you know, if I'm going to impress her, I have to, you know, read some poetry out. But this is in the back of a limousine and I, I think I was definitely, not even, I, I know I was using Hustleblut because I had to, you'd probably know, Mark, but I had that, that uh, I had to hire a special lens so that, um, so that I could not quite a fisheye, but just literally kind of, I was in, in, in the car and light it and have this, this particular lens that gave this um, not distorted quality, but just yep. really amazing. Okay, and so, so was Clive's um, uh, gaze natural, <laughs> or was he directed? Or <laughs> I think I'm quite sure that this one I didn't tell him to do that. <laughs> in okay. my own defence. <laughs> okay, and then another another fashion designer here. Armani, yes, and that that's also definitely medium format Hasselblad. It was in Milan, and I had it was for an. Um, Italian magazine called Amica I, and um, I had a number of days luckily with him so I photographed him in his home in his garden and um, and and you know that I guess was I did shoot it in color and black and white both yeah okay and we got a question actually from Mark um, do you prefer shooting celebrity portraits to the more earthy documentary style portraits or do you like a mix I guess I love a mix. I miss shooting document. Um, I miss shooting kind of high high end celebrities. If you say when I when I don't, and I during lockdown, I created my own project, which was about cold water swimming. So I've done a lot, and definitely all color. And I've shot it um, uh, not so much on medium format because I'm pretty cold, and um, so I've shot it on on cameras that I can move very quickly, quickly with, and that I'm not setting up loads of lighting. Um, but um, I've lost the thread of the question, Mark, sorry. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but, yeah, but, between celebrity and uh, documentary style. Yes, and, and um, so I think um, I've, in the last many years, I've always had a kind of document, some kind of documentary project going. Documentary, just in the in the term documentary, I, I I will have been using whatever camera I feel suits the subject. Mm. I'm I'm not formulaic in that sense, and maybe that's not a good thing. I don't know, but it, it's helped to just be. I very much feel the subject out and see what suits it, mm. but. The portrait, um, the portrait, I've just done a series on the Holocaust survivors, which is in the Imperial War Museum at the moment. And um, that's been, I didn't take assistance. I didn't set up studio shots, but they are very much kind of very close up portraits and very considered in mm. terms of the subject matter. And I've worked it out with the, with the subjects about what 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 I felt was appropriate in those situations. Mm -hmm. And then the other project you mentioned was your water rats, is that right? Yes, my water rat series, yeah. which I, yes. So I was say that's on your Instagram. It is, it's, I haven't um, updated my website on that project. Um, it's on, the, a lot of the images on Instagram and I've, I'm, I've also just finishing a, um, a documentary. So I've filmed them and and um, this we've inter interlaced the stills through the film. Okay. And then Blur uh, for the Sunday Times. Yes, I mean, who doesn't love Blur? I, I'm a big fan of Damon Albarn and the work he's done since, since on, in Gorillas. And this was just an amazing shoot where um, for a couple of days while they were doing a music video, I got to, I got to follow them and um 
and 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 watch all their kind of foibles and habits and idiosyncratic behavior and we ended up in cafes and parks and um and i think that's the luxury of being a photographer is that you you get to 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 put your your beady eye on kind of the inside the inside story really and that's a great privilege yes i agree Okay, so that's um, sort of the images that we had set up, but we've got a few uh, questions. Um, so to go back to the uh, truth and lies, um, let me just see um, a question from Ashrick. Um, as a South African, I cannot help but wonder how you felt as a white photographer at a politically volatile time in South Africa, photographing people living and dealing with trauma. Was that a challenge for you? Yeah, I mean, I felt it strongly, and I think that I've always felt that I had the, I had the luck, um, the fortune of being able to be about as objective as I could be, because I wasn't at that time living in South Africa. I was coming backwards and forwards, and I think that of being ob objective helped quite a lot because a lot of my colleagues that I worked with who were based there had, you know, some of them suffered really, I mean, physically from what they were seeing and what we were seeing. One had pneumonia, another one had a heart attack, another one had a breakdown. So those kind of things are real. And I think, you know, in the human spirit and in the human body, there is always a reaction to trauma, you know, whether we see it initially or afterwards. And I think that I remember, um, I remember where I was transcribing um, testimonies from, the, 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 there, were, there, were, uh, there were pages and pages of documents and books of, from the Truth Commission. And when I came to do the book, Truth and Lies, um, and at that time, I remember being, I was pregnant with my second child. And I remember not knowing if I was nauseous from what I was reading and seeing or from the actual, from my physical state of being pregnant. And I think that it's, I hope I'm answering the question, but you never get off lightly is the point. If you have any sense of, of, of kind of co compassion and empathy, and I don't think you can do the work if, if you don't, if you don't feel it and feel it honestly. That's my yeah. personal opinion. Hmm. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so there's some, some love for your images in the comments. Um, so yeah, if you'd like to see more of Gillian's work, um, we've we've put her website and uh, Instagram details up on the screen again. Uh, so please check it out. Uh, a couple more uh, questions, uh, mainly from me. Um, who's been your most interesting subject uh, to photograph? Um, have you got a favourite or someone you liked working with? I mean, the most. Gosh, it's so difficult and it's, it's much harder to answer the question of who's your been your favorite because there have been so many and so many I felt so privileged to me. I can, you know, difficult subjects. I remember having a hard time with Spike Lee because after the shoot, I, um, I went to process the film and I was so like nobody else is going to do it but me. And I ended up because I hadn't processed a role of 120 film for a long time and I remember loading the canister incorrectly and then having to go and hang out at his hotel for like four hours because he'd gone out to wait to do a second shoot and I didn't know if he'd give it to me and I remember him standing there and going right this is the pose you know that's it and he allowed me like 12 frames or something so you know there, there are always these stories of kind of where it's not so easy I remember doing the the famous novelist Primo Levi and but neither of us being able to speak English and I mean I could speak English he couldn't speak English and my Italian was pretty non-existent at the time and I remember we we communicated through kind of gesticulating and how I got this amazing shot is because he suddenly lifted his glasses and then I had to try and explain to him that I because of the light I needed him to do it again and I remember that being quite challenging and over the weekend I had an exhibition for it at the North Cornwall Book Festival and one of the images was Barbara Cartland and I remember having a, a lot of kind of hilarious um, moment of her telling me that the only people that could photograph in the country were Litchfield and Snowden. And she stopped me after 12 frames and said, you've got to come down and have some tea. And I remember these 
big annuals of, of, of big photo albums of, of that contain all these images of Snowden and, 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 and Beaton and Litchfield and, you know, having, as if to say, like, you'd better have a look at those because clearly you're never gonna, you're never gonna crack it. But also when I called up her, the, the, the home and she said, don't come without your booster. You know, well, you're probably too young to know what a booster is, which was this light that she expected me to have underneath her chin to kind of, you know, minimize shadow. And so I've had some pretty amazing experiences and I'd much rather, you know, if, if I hope that's answered the question, Mark, in yeah, a yeah. some form. Right. Yeah, and you, and you mentioned your light in there, actually. So we've had a question from Gary. Um do you have a favorite lighting setup that you use in your studio? Um, and do you just use one light, uh, one main light source? Um, do you have a- No, uh, I don't. And I, and I, I don't, and I vary it. And I, um, and I, I, and honestly, I do have beautiful natural light. And if I can augment natural light as much as possible, I will do that. Obviously, I'm, I very much feel out what suits the individual. And, um, and you know, I remember actually, I'm, I remember going to photograph Snowden and, 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 and it was in the middle of winter and him saying, why do you need all that lighting? And thinking, oh my God, you know, but there was no way I could not use it because there wasn't any natural light. So, you know, and he was, I think he was trying to persuade me to, to not use anything which would have been dire under the circumstances. Um, but I did, I, you know, so yes, I, I see what suits the situation usually. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I've got a, 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 a various um, things like, you know, beauty dishes or filters and soft boxes and, you know, mm -hmm. like everybody else does probably. Yep. Uh, another question from Mark, um, which photographers influence you the most? I think you mentioned Annie Leibovitz earlier. Is, is there? That was, yeah, I think that was when I was much younger. And, and then, um, you know, at that time, I was wild about um, um, Robert Frank's photography. I, I liked um, August Sander. I, I used to look at Cartes. I loved um, Tina Madotti, um, Diane Arbus. Um, Mary Ellen Mark was somebody when I was younger. I I, I was uh, and Cartier Bresson. So maybe I'm giving and and I and and also I liked um, Richard Avedon's work. I think you can that that influenced me too. Mm. Okay, and just to finish up, um, you know, what's what's next for you? Is there any projects or any, mm. anything you're able to tell us about that you're going to be working on next? Well, I'm, I'm fin working to finish the Water Rat series and that's taken quite a lot of time and energy and, and but have been very wonderful. And so that's a documentary and the exhibition. And I'm, I've been working on a feature documentary for a very long time um, about the Academy Award nominated screenwriter, somebody called Norman Wexler. So I'm working on that. I'm, I'm about to go to Vilnius for a project which, um, which will show my refugee series. And I think that's, that's quite good because it's also based on another book project, which, I've be, which has taken a long time. And it's a family story about lost family, family that were thrown out of Latvia and ended up in Ukraine. And um, the refugee images that I did in Lesvos, Calais, Linosa, Lampedusa have been incorporated into the project, plus a portrait series, which is about the descendants of refugees and how they've contributed to our society and in the UK today, people like, um, oh, well, probably everybody loves sex education, like in Shuti Gatwa, who's a Rwandan refugee, or, um, Esther Freud, whose father was Lucien Freud. Um, there's a the first um, counselor in um, and you in and he was at the EU um, who was in from Sheffield. Um, people probably know. I've just done a blank on his name. And um, 
a Palestinian chef who came to this country and um, what's her name, uh, who wrote the fabulous children's book, The Tiger Who Came to Tea. Sadly, she died not that long ago. Um, a f fabulous writer um, whose name also just escaped me, but that's been incorporated into that work. So, um, so that, that work continues. Those three, three projects I think I mentioned for, for yeah. now. Yeah, that sounds good. So we'll look out for that. Um, yeah, so that brings us to the end, Gillian. Thank you very much for your time and for, for agreeing to take part in this for us and for WEX. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, Hasselblad. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Yeah, and hopefully we'll be able to meet again soon uh, now that things have eased up a bit with our restrictions. So, uh, yes, I'll hopefully um, have a catch up again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Thank you, everybody. And then just to uh, finish off, um, just to help promote the next talk in uh, WEX's series of uh, Change the Image webinars. Uh, so tomorrow, um, a webinar with um, Emily Gillespie, who I believe has photographed in and around the NHS during the pandemic. So it would be uh, very topical and interesting, that one. Uh, so that's tomorrow and you can register on the WEX website. And of course, any further information on Hasselblad, you can of course go to uh, WEX's website and also, of course, Hasselblad.com, uh, where we've got all product information and inspirational stories and images uh, from the likes of Gillian. Uh, so, yeah, thanks very much again for joining us today. Uh, thanks to Wex for having us and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you very much. <laughs>